All right, so the session is now being recorded. And uh, the format is basically that each presentation will be 15 to 20 minutes with a small window for Q&A. And that will leave us with about 10 minutes at the end for bigger <laughs> that brings the two chapters together. All right, so I will stop share Jacob and Shana and we look forward to your presentation. A is titled Open Pedagogy, Big and Small, uh, comparing open pedagogy efforts in large and small higher education settings. Uh, so my name is Jacob Moore. I'm an associate professor of engineering at Penn State Montalto uh, and an author of an open uh, educational resource for engineering statics and dynamics myself. Uh, and I'm Shana Hollick. I'm currently the interim director of library services at Wilson College, which is also in Pennsylvania. All right, so the purpose of this work uh, was to compare and contrast open pedagogy efforts at large and small institutions of higher education. Uh, very simple uh, purpose. We just wanted to explore these and the, the two varying settings that we had access to. So if we can advance the slide. Yeah, um, I'll, sorry, I'll jump in here just to note that for the purpose of this chapter, um, our definition of open pedagogy was very broad um, and included basically all efforts to integrate open access materials and OER into the educational process. So you may hear us use words like OER and open pedagogy sort of interchangeably because um, we took that more holistic view. All right, so a little bit of background on the two, in, uh, two institutions that we were looking at. Um, so we had large university and small college, uh, a difference of um, more than 80,000 students to about 1,000 students. Uh, we had a public nonprofit and private nonprofit for large and small, respectively. Uh, and the large university is a big R1 uh, university. Uh, the small college uh, does offer master's degrees, so it's an M3 designation in the Carnegie uh, system. Um, and then both programs were primarily residential with some online uh, degree programs in the case of a large university or just online courses in the case of a small college. Um, so we go to the methods. Uh, so looking at this, we were kind of gathering data on what are the open pedagogy efforts using some semi-structured interviews. Uh, so they were designed to compare the roles of people involved, the motivations of the people involved, the actions and the barriers uh, that they encountered at their university setting. So we tried to uh, uh, we tried to target a range of participants, uh, both faculty and staff. Uh, at the small college, it was a little more limited, uh, as we're going to see. Um, but uh, we tried to get a, cro a good cross section of the people involved in open education. Uh, so the actual interv interview protocol, if you want to look at more details, is available. Uh, as an appendix to the chapter. All right, so if we could advance the slide. All right, so at the, for the participants, uh, at the small college, uh, we uh, had the participants identified by the OER librarian, uh, and it was three faculty members involved in the uh, participants, and that represented kind of the entire population of people that were working with OER or open pedagogy at the time. Uh, large university, there were a lot more people uh, involved, so we had to take a cross-section of people. We couldn't get everyone involved in open educational resources or open pedagogy. Uh, and we, we put this together by uh, a, a staff member working in the Teaching and Learning with Technology Office that coordinated a lot of open pedagogy efforts across the university. Uh, so overall, we had a, uh, a sample of eight individuals uh, kind of mixed between faculty and staff positions uh, in all. Um, go on to the results at this point. Okay, so I'll jump in here. Um, we split our results up into sort of four general areas that we'll walk through one by one. So first, we just did a very basic look at the types of individuals that were involved in these interviews that we did. Um, we noticed that the teaching faculty, the instructors that we talked to were a combination of um, faculty who already had tenure, some who were tenure track, and some who were full-time teaching faculty, just completely independent of the tenure system. Uh, we did notice that we did not, we were not able to identify any adjunct instructors who were involved in this work at either institution. So that was a huge limitation. Um, we have some thoughts about why that might've been the case, but that might be a thing to look at in the future. 
Um, we also talk to a number of people in staff roles who you know, do not have faculty status at these uh, colleges and universities. And the most common roles there were librarians and instructional designers. Um, we did notice sort of a general trend in that at small college, um, people tend to be in more generalized positions, even the faculty, you know, they might be um, a professor of philosophy, but they also teach courses outside of that department because faculty at small college tend to just be more generalized and it's sort of an all hands on deck. You end up having to do a lot of different things. Whereas um, some of the folks we talked to at large university tended to have more specialized roles. Um, so this probably was directly a, uh, a factor in some of the things that we found. So well, first thing we really looked at were the motivations, you know, what got people into even starting to look into OER or think about um, doing open pedagogy sorts of things in their classes. Um, the first thing that a lot of people mentioned was the high cost of traditional textbooks. I think most of us here who've been doing OER work for any amount of time have heard this a lot. Um, that more and more people are realizing that textbooks are astronomically expensive and that school itself is astronomically expensive and that this might be a burden for students. Um, we also had some folks who talked about student access more generally, especially for online courses. Um, and we're gonna talk more specifically about what that means in a second. Um, we have some, some specific quotes that we pulled out from the interviews, um, both in the chapter, there's a lot of them. And then in this presentation, we pulled out some really representative ones that we liked and really wanted to share. Um, so access, not just in terms of cost, but in terms of like, do you have access to the internet? Do you have access to a, a place that can ship you a physical textbook? Like, can you buy things from Amazon? Can you get mail where you live? Um, and then we also saw some more philosophical motivations for doing this work. Um, some people talked about, you know, they were really interested in exploring these alternative ways to develop and share knowledge, especially when it came to things like maybe getting students involved in the work, which I think Cynthia is going to talk a little bit about um, later this hour. Um, and we had some faculty who said things like they just weren't content with the current options that were available as far as commercial textbooks. So they wanted to write their own stuff for their own course. And since they were going to do it anyway, they thought, why don't I openly license it and make it accessible to all the other people out there doing this work who might also not be satisfied with the current options. So read you a few quotes um, that specifically speak to these motivations. They're also going to show up on the screen, but I am going to read them just in case um, if anyone's calling in on the phone or doesn't want to read, you don't have to look at the screen. Um, so this one is from someone we talked to at small college and it says, and you know, I don't know how familiar you are with the students at small college. Most of them are like first generation college. A lot of them don't have the money to spend on expensive, like having huge expenses on their books and so forth. Uh, so this is a representative quote that really speaks to that cost motivation. There's one, uh, this one's from large university that as publishers like Pearson in particular have become a lot more predatory. Note that that was their word, not mine, <laughs> though I probably agree with them. Uh, the way that they release new editions very quickly to kind of undercut the used book market on the students, I found that very offensive. So this is another example of some motivation for why people are looking into this. Um, another one from large university. The other major factor was the fact that I have students all over the world in my online courses. And someone in rural India, for example, doesn't necessarily have the opportunity to get a textbook that someone here domestically would have. Um, this speaks to that issue of like other types of access. Um, I know I personally, as a librarian uh, in the fall semester, or no, I'm sorry, it was the spring semester, you know, pandemic, we all went online in a hurry. And I had a professor frantically calling me because they had a student who flew home to Australia and didn't have their textbook. And there was no way we looked all over online, not one person anywhere on the internet sold this book and would ship it to Australia. So there was no way for them to access that physical book. So things like that, even outside of cost um, are an issue. And one more that speaks to sort of the philosophical motivations here from small college says, for me, there's a kind of bigger, a kind of philosophical grain to this that really resonates with me. So the idea of creating alternative spaces or venues and pathways to the development of and sharing of knowledge, I think is really important. Um, this was really heartening for us to see because it really speaks directly to that sort of 
um, the things that open pedagogy is really good at when it comes to opening up the way that we uh, share and construct knowledge. So we identified, we did notice a few sort of structural incentives. And for the most part, throughout these interviews, we noticed a lot of similarities between folks at small college and folks at large university. We're really talking about the same things most of the time. Here's where we found some of the biggest differences. Um, the biggest one, of course, was that large university has an existing program in place that offers a financial incentive for folks who are doing this work. So people who are authoring their own OER can get phys like actual monetary funding to do so. Even people who are adapting existing OER for their classrooms can get funding for that. Small college does not have any sort of system like that in place, um, or at least they didn't at the time we did these interviews, which is about a year and a half, two years ago now. Um, but one thing that was encouraging is that we noticed the importance of personal support and interactions um, played almost equally a large role. Like it wasn't just about financial incentives for doing this. People had all sorts of other really good reasons. Um, and things like having the support of an OER librarian or an instructional designer who was really knowledgeable about this stuff and could help guide faculty through the process was almost just as important or sometimes even more important than having uh, grant money. Um, positive student reactions also provided a good incentive. Um, so here's a quote, uh, I appreciate you know that I have a contact person who's a librarian that I can say, okay, this is what I'm looking for. Can you help me? And know that there's someone to work with me at each stage. Um, another one's the whole team has been really helpful up there. I mean, I think it's just really like five or six people. I've sat in a room with these people and they'll stay with me the whole day and help me get through stuff and be really, really helpful. Uh, we also saw some barriers. So the barriers were similar across both settings, interestingly enough, and I think it's not going to be a surprise to any faculty on this call that time was the biggest barrier by far. Um, when you have only so many hours in a day to focus on things that are your job, you might want to choose things or prioritize things that are going to advance your career. And so this ties directly into the third bullet point here, the uncertainty of the value of OER adoption. Um, again, I think we've talked a lot as, as a community about things like, you know, does me using an OER for my class count for promotion and tenure? Um, can I put that in like my faculty activity report and get credit for it and like a nice pat on the back for my dean? And if I can't, then maybe I'm going to prioritize something else that does give me those benefits. Um, so one interesting sort of side thing that we found is there were some bureaucratic barriers at large university that we had never considered and that we didn't expect uh, that were not present at small college. Um, so that was also a barrier. Um, and there are some more quotes I'm gonna read you that kind of illustrate these. Uh, the first one's from large university. It says, uh, it's, this is not the sort of thing, or at least I haven't been able to make it the sort of thing that will lead to promotion to full pro professor. That is, I've struggled with what venues and what to put in referee journals. Uh, another at large university said, well, right now I'm waiting for large universities risk management to finally approve a contract for me to, in essence, write my own OER textbook for one of my two online survey courses. And, you know, we've gone through everything. I'm still waiting to see an MOU. And basically it's just sitting with risk management for some reason. Um, that quote in particular really, um, talked about the, that's a real good example of these bureaucratic barriers that we didn't realize were a thing um, until we started sitting down and talking to people. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jacob for a few minutes to talk a little more in depth about our conclusions. Jacob, you are still muted, I believe. There All right. Are. So for the conclusions, uh, the, the structural barriers and uh, incentives were remarkably similar. Uh, we, we noticed a lot of similarities between the two groups. Uh, we were kind of expecting, to be honest, we were kind of expecting uh, more differences, uh, but it is uh, actually kind of useful that there are a lot of similarities because they don't need to, we have common strategies that are going to work in a lot of places. Uh, so there was more monetary support at large university, uh, but the, the personal support, uh, particularly in the form of staff, staff expertise and time, uh, was was basically seen to be a more important uh, in driving open adoption at both institutions. Um, so having the people available, I mean, you still have to you know, pay the support staff, 
Uh, but it's not about handing money directly to the faculty. It's often about having the support people there, uh, having the staff there that can really help people out or fa help faculty out uh, in adopting or authoring these tools. Uh, and there were repeated uh, references by the faculty uh, to address the importance of, of librarian staff support uh, in particular, we've gone through some of those quotes. Uh, there's more of those in the paper as well. Um, so I'll hand it back to Shana for some of the recommendations we have in all of this. Yeah, um, we wanted to take a look at these conclusions and um, you know, kind of leave you guys with, we're, we're wrapping up here. Um, some things that, again, you might already know if you've been doing this work, but some things that we really thought might be um, helpful to put, to put our efforts in the future. Um, and this is uh, a lovely picture of a cat here to support you all um, through this ridiculous time that we're living in. But basically that's like the number one recommendation is people really over and over identified um, the need for support in doing this work. And I think a lot of people, they hear support and they assume it means we need to start a grant program and we need to pay faculty for the extra work that they're doing. And that is, that's a good thing. Grant programs are good. Financial incentives are good, but they're not necessarily completely sufficient. Um, if you are at a small college or a super underfunded place and you don't have the ability to start a grant program, it doesn't mean you're just you know, throw your hands up and there's nothing you can do. Um, that, you know, having specialized staff support um, was one thing we saw over and over again that, and, and sometimes this is staff that you may already have on your campuses and you just don't realize that they know how to do these sorts of things. So librarians and um, sometimes instructional designers and other support staff already have expertise in things like copyright and open licensing, in things like how to find OER. Um, as a librarian, I get questions all the time from faculty that are like, well, I tried to find OER for my courses and I looked in like two places and I couldn't find anything. So I guess it's not out there. And I'm like, I wish, like, let me look for you. <laughs> like, this is what I do for a living. It's not an imposition. It's not a problem. Like, I, I can do a more thorough search and find you things. Um, time was also another huge issue. Um, so we had some faculty talk about like, well, maybe if they were given a course release for a semester, then that would free up some time for them to author an OER or um, really adapt an OER for use in their course. And so that might be another avenue to explore. Um, and also recognizing this work in a more formal way. So letting this work uh, count for things in promotion and tenure packages or um, even recognizing it uh, through you know, some sort of more informal recognition program. But a lot of times this is sort of seen as extra work that doesn't count as research or service or the sort of scholarly work that um, faculty really need to do in order to get tenure or to remain competitive in their fields. And that's a shame because we know those of us who do this work know just how in-depth and scholarly and, and time consuming and important this work really is. So um, I'm going to leave you with this cat uh, I'd like, we wanted to leave a few minutes um, where we could take some questions right now. If anyone had questions specifically for us, like feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Um, or we can save them for the end, whichever is more comfortable. We're also going to have some time at the end where we kind of squish these two together. But um, I think I'm looking at the time and I think I'm going to stop here and turn things over to Cynthia. And I'll start sharing, but if people, oh, it looks like Cheryl has a question. So um, I'll get my, my thing up while you answer that. So Cheryl's asking, do either institution offer faculty peer-to-peer -peer support from someone who's used OER to one just starting? Um, we, no one, it didn't come up in any of the interviews. Um, I don't think, like there's no formal system that I know of. Jacob, do you know? There's certainly no formal system. Uh, there was staff support and uh, the, the staff members that were kind of coordinating some of the efforts did identify other faculty members that were working on OER, uh, but it was all just kind of coming together with this one staff member. So staff were generally the, the connection points or the hubs of a lot of this. Sounds like a cool idea though, right? Like having like a 
more maybe more formalized like faculty mentorship sort of thing from hey i've done this i've actually adopted one for my class um, um i'll take for, this one other question quick uh did anyone share examples or specifics of when oer work has been valued in the pnt process and what it took to get there nope it didn't come up <laughs> And yeah, I wish it did. I think in the last year or so, I have started to see some more specific examples and some other places, but in these, in the limited interviews that we were able to do, we didn't hear about it, which is a bummer. Cool. Okay. I, I guess I'll get going. Um, and again, we'll have more time at the end um, for, for both of the presentations. So let's, let's get jamming. So I wrote a chapter in this book called Informed Open Pedagogy and Information Literacy Instruction and Student Authored Open Projects. I work at a community college. Um, so I'm both a librarian and teach four credit classes. So librarians don't always do that. So it, it's, it's really awesome. And that gives me kind of an extra way to do this open pedagogy work. I'm gonna talk really briefly about the actual chapter, but I wanted to talk more about the example that I share in the chapter today. So, Every time. Okay, let's go. So the book chapter, the most like in a really short way, I'm saying that open pedagogy um, is often talked about as this liberating thing. Like if we do open pedagogy, there we therefore um, liberate students. But I don't think it can be unless we teach students about what open pedagogy is, and also just talking about openness in general. So my definition of an, an uninformed open pedagogy is one in which instructors teach students about the greater open education movement. Students are able to decide individually and negotiate as a class how this open work looks and collective author, individual and collective authorship. Um, so I should probably say that this is for open pedagogy in the definition where students are creating something um, open in, in the confines of their classroom. And students can opt out of this at any point in the class. So they don't have to, you know, do something that's open if they feel it's unsafe or they don't want to, um, that there's multiple ways for students to engage. And so for the librarians here, this is um, pretty well known, but for maybe faculty who aren't um, familiar, there's something called the ACRL framework. Um, I didn't spell it out for some reason, but it, basically it's these information literacy practices um, that I'll get to really into really briefly that align really well with student authored open projects. <sighs> what, what's wrong with me? Okay, boop, boop. Okay, framework in a nutshell, there's like these six frames and these things tell us how we might think about information literacy when we're teaching students. So the thing for librarians is we usually only see students for maybe like an hour or really these, these short bits and we can't get this all in. Their information literacy is incredibly complex. I'm not going to get into all of these things, but it looks like um, Shana has put the framework into the uh, chat, so please check that out. So things like what does what is authority? Who who has authority? How do we confer authority? Do students have authority? These are all these types of complex questions that information literacy gets at. So I'm going to try to show you how I've done that in my actual classroom. So I teach library science 101 at a community college. So a community college is, you know, it's, it's embedded in the community. It is, uh, we, we, we um, have associate certificates and a lot of our students are trying to transfer. And if you're taking library science 101, typically you are on the transfer track. You're learning information literacy specifically in the context of doing, um, you know, usually freshman composition classes and eventual transfer. Um, so the, the course learning outcomes, in my opinion, is a little boring. It's constructive bibliography focused around a research question, um, selecting appropriate keywords, et cetera, et cetera. All, all really important things to do. Um, this annotated bibliography doesn't usually spur, you know, a lot of um, thoughts. Like students just kind of do it to get by, even though it is a really important information genre for students to know if they're planning to uh, do undergraduate, graduate coursework. So in our, our class modules, it's like how to use a library catalog, how to use databases effectively, how to evaluate open internet sources, plagiarism and citation. And something I do that most instructors don't do is I have a module on open access and OER. So students are learning about the open access movement. They watch the film, uh, what is the film, the documentary whose name is eluding me, someone can probably help me out. Um, 
And we talk about a lot of these different concepts around open education. Whenever I do a presentation, this one should have, but um, yesterday was an interesting day. I have a Creative Commons license. I always contextualize that. I don't just show them a presentation with a CC license. I tell them, okay, this is why I have a CC license and how this is different from this CC license that our book uses. So we have an OER textbook as well. Um, I think contextualizing OER, even if you're just using an open textbook in your class, tell them why this OER textbook is important as opposed to using a proprietary textbook. It is the movie Paywall. Thank you so much, Pauline. So um, Paywall is a great move, uh, great documentary. It's open access and students really resonate with it. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to this. Um, in my book chapter, there's this appendix that's, that shows you how to do this assignment I'm, I'm about to talk about. It's a zine contribution assignment. Um, so just check that out. But I actually have a, um, a template here that reads a little bit easier maybe. So a zine is kind of this small publication. It looks a little, pamphlety it's usually published and distributed by um, creators for like a like a small scale production um, and it's very like text-based for the most part although you do see digital digital scenes so i have this assignment um, i kind of tell students how to do it um, we're all creating one zine and each student makes a little half sheet and um, that all comes together for this like overall zine and um, these are all just kind of logistical things I'll just kind of go down um, and I put little notes here, like what you should be looking for. So the purpose of the zine for my class is to educate other students at ELAC at my institution. So the LS 101 students are educating other students what information literacy is and how they can be good researchers as well. Um, we have a little blip here about fair use and copyright. So I brought in a bunch of newspapers and magazines. So a lot of times students will ask, okay, but this is stuff that is copyrighted essentially, can I, can I use this? So this gives us an opportunity to talk about fair use and how we're really just using little bits of information from these things or just pictures and transforming them and how they may be um, uh, considered fair use. Um, we also talk about their own authorship, like what when they make stuff that it's copyrighted. So they are really centered in their kind of author's rights as well. Um, so, okay, so so this is kind of what it looks like. It's We have all the bits of what the zine is gonna look like, cover, author page, table of contents, intro. And then what they end up really, the bulk of the assignment here is that we have these kind of one, two, three, four, five, sorry. Okay, I can't figure this out right now, but there's lots lots of different elements going on um, in this assignment. And if it says available, the students can sign up for this bit and it is related to their open textbook. I have an example here. This was my actual class. And so you can see like I put my name under professor name and then they also they just start filling out information. So for the title, they kind of put in whatever titles they were thinking of. So we went with information power, everyone plus one what title they liked. I really liked information hashtag lit, but I, you know, I'm the professor, I don't get to, to choose. It's a democracy. So we went with that. And then they actually decided what metadata would go into the zine. So they wanted to say that the collective authorship was by library science or library 101 honor students. Um, it, the, we put the date as fall 2018, as opposed to other ways that we could have put in the date. We made a lot of decisions collectively along the way. Um, hopefully this, this all makes sense. Um, so that's how we like laid out the assignment. I'm gonna show some examples of what the assignment actually looked like. So again, information, information equal, oh, info equals power was a title we agreed upon. One student made this cover. Um, you, can, you can't actually see a lot of it. It didn't come out in the copier. Uh, we also went over what a copier is and how it works. And a lot of students um, struggled with that, like what shows up, what doesn't show up. So info equals power, really great cover. I wish I had a copy, but it's at, in my office. Um, this is the table of contents that we, decide, we decided on. And then the students themselves made a dedication page. They decided on it, dedicated to the struggling and confused. I loved it. Okay, so <laughs> you'll see that these all like have very different, uh, they all came out really differently and they all, it's, it's pretty cohesive. So we had a keyword searching bit, um, someone took a graph out of the textbook and just placed it here. 
Um, the next one, a student was a little bit more, uh, um, you know, didn't just take things out of the textbook, but replicated a Google search page. I really loved that. Um, I wrote developing a research question, so don't mind that um, scope. Uh, so this student made a really, really beautiful page, but it didn't actually um, copy really well. So I use this example for students. I'm like, you know, if you have really dark images, it's really shiny, that's not necessarily going to look good in a copier. Um, I love this one, the student, um, I didn't actually show any examples today here with students who put their names on the actual pages, but the student put v VRG, their initials. Um, so students were able to put their whole name on an ind individual page, they could put their initials, or they could just like not put their name at all. And at the front of the book, or the zine, there is all the authors who wanted to be listed. And so some students have their full name, someone with a pseudonym, someone first name, last initial, and then some students didn't want to be involved at all. Um, so everyone had kind of different layers of what their authorship looked like. And it, um, this one, again, didn't come out really well, um, but we learned from the process. And this is my favorite one, because one of the biggest things was we were taught, I was telling students, like, you're communicating to other students, how can you get the attention of other students? And, you know, you could look at this and be like, okay, it's got a bad word on it. Um, but it, it does like draw your attention. There's something to be said about how the student decided to elicit the attention of other students. And if you look at it, it actually, it, it's really informative. Um, it's cutting, cutting bits out of the textbook. I really like it. Um, but I can see, I can see her being like, okay, the professor said to be creative and I can do whatever I want, but I don't know if she actually meant that, but I, I really did mean it. So I, I love that. Um, and again, like some of them are really just straightforward. Uh, this, this person just kind of synthesized the textbook. Um, so, so students all kind of took different approaches to how they, they did this work. And I actually have, um, this is a, a research guide and you can see the whole zine. I didn't want to put students' names here, but if you wanted to look at the whole zine, you can actually go to the assignment repository and the, the example is here. So I'm going to put that in the chat right now. Okay. So going back, final reflections. We There's a metacognitive uh, aspect of this whole um, assignment. So students have to kind of reflect back on the class. They have to look at the learning outcomes and think about how they developed their thoughts. Like they really had to think about their learning through the process and think about what they're going to be doing in, in the future. So I'm going to read a couple of testimonials. The Zeno is based on the concepts we covered in class as a way to help other students. So they understand kind of their, the, the audience how to do research and what they should be looking for when they're conducting their research. Um, I like that they said that we're helping the ELAC community get a snippet. It's not the full-fledged class, but at least this is a little way that we can help other students um, learn this material. Uh, a lot of students had a lot of fun with this. Um, so this student said, uh, we created an, an uninformative book that can help others who need information on a particular topic or improve their information literacy skills. And um, because this person had to create part of um, or do their contribution, it helped them understand the information a lot better. Um, we all know that students learn more when they're teaching other people how to do stuff. So I think they, they caught on that. I didn't have to tell them you're teaching to learn, but they, they articulated it themselves. And I love this one I liked a lot because the student never talked in class. I had two students like that too. They just never talked in class and they both had the best reflections um, in, in class or in the um, discussion forum. So working on the Zine is my favorite assignment. Um, in this class, I fell behind pretty fast and I consciously knew, uh, know it was because we only met once a week. And so I never really looked at our online textbook besides specific parts for the homework. I think this kind of reflects that my students are really honest. We, we built a lot of honesty through the process. And so, you know, she said, hey, I wasn't doing all the readings, but because I had like um, some stake in this assignment, I felt really compelled to, to catch up and, and relearn this material. Um, and then this is one of my favorite, this is the last one I'm gonna share, but the student said, um, kind of uh, associated this assignment with like, influencer culture, I guess, almost. So she was talking about how people show their zines online and how it's almost surreal to think that I help create, help contribute to a zine, which I think is really powerful. And then the last line was just really cute. So it's also made me feel like one of those cool Instagram girls with like 40,000 followers. Um, so I loved that. 
yeah, that's kind of all I had. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. So if anyone had any questions, uh, we can do a little bit of, you know, we can do specific questions for this um, project, or I don't know if we want to move into Q and A for everybody. Cynthia, I think there is one oh. question in the chat. Yes, um, I have taught, taught this class completely on, online since COVID. Actually, this class is, is almost always online, um, but I, I was gonna incorporate the zine assignment. And I even said so at the beginning of this semester. Uh, a lot of my students have just not been able to kind of complete the course. Like they're really struggling. I've had to cut out a lot of the content and the zine was one of the first things to go. Um, I just finished grading for fall. We got an extension for grading. Um, and I think only 17 out of my 30 students like continued, like I had no idea where they went. They were just dealing with so much that we, we really bare bones it um, in fall, unfortunately. unfortunately. I don't think um, a lot of students had experience with zines. Like I think that that last student was the only one who indicated they had ever like even seen a zine. Most students were just like, I don't know what this is. Um, uh, so we had a lot of examples in my, my physical classroom. I have a lot of like, I bring in my own zines. And then if I don't, if I just teach it online, I show pictures of my zines, but uh, those are all in my office. <laughs> Yeah, and students also don't understand like copier, like like copier literacy, I guess. It's like, you know, what transfers really well to black and white, um, you know, what doesn't. I was really explicit. I said, you know, this is only doing black. Um, shades, you know, come out differently. Um, yeah. Oh, I'll share the assignment again. It was in the same place where the actual zine is, but... Um, Here's the link again. And I will add to the Open Pedagogy Approaches book is an OER in itself about OER. So, um, so through the different chapters that you'll read, um, like Cynthia's in particular, she does share all that information as OER. So uh, modifiable, all that. Uh, we thought that we would uh, present a question to all of you and maybe get some conversation going. Um, because in both presentations, uh, they've talked about motivation and, um, and I guess incentive with the, the case of the students as well, I guess, you know, that incentive, maybe they didn't know it going into the zine, but, but what did they come out with? Um, but the question we wanted to ask all of you was, you know, what, what are motivations that you've heard or that you've had going into open educational work um, before COVID? And then uh, whether this is personal or things you've heard, um, that might vary quite uh, vastly from what we have experienced since COVID. So um, either add some, some comments to the chat or, or open up and there's not a ton of us, um, but we could talk one by one. But I know we have a, a good mix of library and uh, instructors in the group. Yeah, I just wanna say um, like Jacob and I in particular did all of our interviews well before COVID. And we were, you know, we've been thinking about like how much things have changed and how like I've been hearing from all sorts of um, people in higher ed and even K-12 who are really giving OER a second or third or much harder look um, now that they're doing a lot more teaching online um, and access is becoming a thing. So if anyone else has experiences to share there, that'd be cool. Yeah, I like that uh, does mention, this is the wave of the future of teaching, which is great. Hi, I've worked with uh, instructor who teaches both French and Arabic and her issue with the French textbook was that it was incredibly expensive, but it had um, some really good ancillary materials. So uh, while she was able to find a French textbook, um, OER, and I think it might have been under uh, a VC campus, finding the ancillary materials was a little difficult, but she jumped in and started making some of her own videos and included students in making videos as well. She contacted the speech instructor who was teaching online and kind of got a general outline of how students could um, make and share videos. And uh, she found that, that it really did change the tenor of the class. For her Arabic class, it was just really difficult to find OER, but we did find some things that were out there. And again, she 
really started enjoying creating her own materials. She had a lot, she taught for a lot of years, but it was just organizing them. So um, I think the motivation for her, her was both the creativity that she experienced, which was unexpected consequence of, of doing OER. And, um, and that was really nice to see. I'll second the uh, ancillary materials being quite important. Um, I know in engineering, the test banks and Canvas quiz questions and interactive homework sets, um, all of that is kind of a selling point for a lot of the commercial textbooks that are very expensive. Uh, and it, it takes a lot of time. There are efforts, uh, there's tools such as uh, WebWork, uh, which is an interactive, it's randomly generated homework problems using random numbers. Uh, so there's increasing sets of these ancillary materials in addition to a lot of the open educational resource or the open textbook uh, part of the project as well. And Cheryl, if I could clarify, were these her motivations uh, before COVID or has she really picked this up during COVID? Well, she's been teaching the courses online before COVID. So, okay. um, and she also teaches face to face. Um, I haven't talked to her since um, COVID, but uh, I know the fact that she had taught the courses online made a huge difference because they were structured to be online courses and she had built in discussion. Um, but she is also, there is a small conference that I found out about, I think it was at Kansas State University for language um, instructors uh, and uh, using open pedagogy. So now she's found a community and um, since everybody's online, I think a lot of her courses are going to stay online and, and I don't know what it's going to be um, in terms of the fall, but I know we're online through the end of the summer at least. That's wonderful. Oh yeah, so Elaine is looking for a link to that conference if anyone has that. Um, and then what I also was thinking of is, is a barrier. So when I asked that question, did it happen after COVID? Um, I just wonder too, to add to the motivation question, um, barriers, now that we're, I mean, professors are learning how to teach online for the most part. So, you know, this adds an interesting layer, but also sometimes an essential layer. So um, any comments or, or experiences with that? Hi, this is Elaine. Um, I'm, a, I'm an instructional designer at JMU, and I feel like this is where I'm struggling, is that I have these faculty that are, um, you know, maybe they had some online experience, maybe they didn't, but they're kind of in this space where they're like ready to break their course, right? They're ready to just break it open and like let go of the like, why is this chronological? Why are my units this way? Why am I doing any of this this way? And they're on that like precipice of, of ready to redo things. And I'm like, oh, this will be such a good time to bring in, you know, open, right? And talk about it. But there is, it's such a fine line to walk because they have so much other, so many other things they're thinking about. So like, I have a hard time sometimes like figuring out the right moment and how to introduce it and kind of the right path for each person. You know what I mean? I don't know. So I don't know if others are finding that like there's an energy there, but I'm not quite sure how to like harness it or leverage it with them. I'll speak. Uh, so I've got a, another publication that just came out um, on OER specifically in engineering mechanics and with a lot of the instructors, there's always like a, a straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, so there's a, usually building tension. Uh, a lot of times in engineering, it's the, the high cost of textbooks. They can be up to $200 a course. Um, but there's always something like they, a new edition comes out for a textbook and they're just like, well, I got to rebuild everything anyway. Uh, or it's, they end up teaching a new course. And so they just want to jump into that. Uh, or the publisher does something that really annoys them uh, that particular semester. So take advantage of people on the precipice because you can kind of like push them and get them to, it's a, it's a big effort to integrate OER into the, the course. Uh, but a lot of times if they're on the edge, there's just something that's gonna push them over the edge. Yeah, I'll put my colleague Kristen on the spot, but it kind of gets to both Elaine and Cheryl's um, situations. Uh, but Kristen, do you wanna talk about your work with Julie? Well, I, before I say that, that, I'll also mention, I think too, there's the, 
like uh, Jacob was saying, people that are on the precipice of taking of of making those changes and wanting to um, take that they're able, they're willing and able to take the time. Um, and at what level do they want it? Can they do that work? Um, but also sometimes it's the, on a programmatic level that everybody's got to teach the same class and they want it to be consistent and everybody's got to agree on it. So you've got all these people that you have to make sure they're all on the same page that they'll agree to the same activities. So that I I feel in my, in my beginner's point of view has been um, a little intimidating. Um, but right now I've, I'm just getting my toes wet uh, with OER, with um, a French professor at the U of R where um, we worked with her French culture class and we had a, a few students make OER and we're in the process of making a repository for French culture. Um, so we're kind of just getting begin beginner kind of work with this, learning about it, and then we'll do more with her French migration class in the fall where it will the course itself will become an OER, but we're just learning as we go. Um, so, but that's, I'm very much at the introduction level. <laughs> um, I actually, if anybody has any, any advice or um, suggestions, someone who's just embarking on um, building a repository of, um, of OER um, from the librarian or the professor level uh, or perspective, I would love to hear it. I feel like there's so many choices that we can make and how we go about doing it. Um, so if there's anything, any any nuggets of advice anybody has, I'd love that. <laughs> Addressing the uh, the peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, so on the, on the faculty member side of things, uh, it's uh, it all seems to be informal is what I've gathered. Like there's no like I haven't, I've never had a peer mentor. I've never seen anyone who's like a peer mentor for someone adopting OER. Uh, it's usually, it's a lot of the straw that broke camel's back kind of deal too, where it's like, someone's really fed up with the textbook. They have a, a peer that's like, oh yeah, I should totally do it. Totally take that plunge. Um, and that's, that helps to, to push them uh, to do it. But it is a lot of individual work in the end. Like your course is your course and you have to make the, the resources work with what you have. I just wanna throw out there, um, like I'd also be interested if anyone has any ideas or thoughts about how student engagement may or may not have changed since COVID. I think Cynthia touched on this a little bit, but like I've noticed it's been way harder than normal for me to get students on my campus engaged in anything. <laughs> but, so that makes student-centered open pedagogy more difficult, right? And I don't know how much of that is pandemic related, how much of that is the fact that we went completely online in the fall and they weren't used to online courses or online structure at my institution, um, or how much of that is just that the world is on fire and so it's hard to do anything right now, which I personally relate to. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of yeses in the, in the chats, like it's all of the above. And I think um, Colleen wanted to say something, is that? Um, yeah, I was going to say, um, so I've seen a lot of that as well. Um, and I think a lot of it is just like Zoom fatigue, like students are just so tired of being on video chat all the time. Uh, and I think one thing that I've tried to do when I do teaching is um, incorporate like other tools where it's maybe more text based communication, or just alternative methods of interacting where you're not just, you know, on the video screen all day, uh, or something like a message board or a forum, I find really helps for engagement because they can, you know, get online when they want to and post a message and then read it later. Uh, so yeah, I think a lot of it, and like you said, a lot of it is just sort of the state of the world right now, which we can't do anything about. But um, yeah, I think it, alternative methods of engagement that don't involve video chatting, um, some students uh, work better with those. Yeah, I know um, Jacob was, uh, and, and Shana and I were talking about videos being really, really useful. Um, I know my students really enjoy not reading right now. And I've always taught my class asynchronously, the online class, it's never been live. There's never been any Zoom component, um, but students are still really struggling to get through these textbooks. So, um, and honestly, the, the online textbook we use is still a little bit jargony. It's a little bit hard. So I spent this semester um, transforming those chapters into just like shorter um, videos. They're totally not polished. They're just like, this will get us through the semester. 
And it's still, it's like pulling teeth, but students have confided these, these really incredible stories of, of, of what they're going through. And it's like, I, I don't know. It's, it's really, it's really hard to get through these times right now. Cynthia, I just had a thought if the uh, text, I don't know about now with all that's going on, but uh, if the textbook is really jargony, it would be interesting to see students um, kind of convert those definitions or that language into their own and kind of explain the concepts on their own. Just like in your zine, like they, they use their, their language to speak to each other, so. Oh, I think that'd be so cool. And actually I'm on a project right now creating another like library science um, textbook, but for community college students. Um, which is helpful, but sometimes like I think about words, I'm like, I don't know if students know what that means. Like we were talking about the word broadcast um, and I was like, I don't, I think that's jargony. Um, and it was only because I took a radio class over the summer where I was like, oh, I don't think I know, I, I know what this word means. So it's like, yeah, how do we break down all these things? And, and also right now I'm in this position where I'm a, a professor at a, a college, but I'm also a student. And so I've been talking a lot with students outside of my like authoritative role as a librarian and grad students and, and undergrads reveal a lot of things when you're in the student role. So I think about embeddedness too, like how can we just talk to students outside of these like it, formal classroom settings better also. It, it's hard to replicate for sure. Yeah, I've definitely seen some cool projects. I think there was one out of BYU where a course will take an already openly licensed textbook that might be a little too jargony or at a level that's like maybe not quite right for this class. And like, you know, by the end of the course, when the students are experts in that topic and they might be a little more comfortable with the jargon, having the students actually like revise the chapters of this open book and write new ones and incorporate it so, and, and do it so it's more in language that's accessible to them. And then, you know, the professor can use that for the next class and then they can kind of keep iterating on it and building on it so that it remains current and that the language remains current and accessible. So that's really cool. So we'll take a, a little pause if there's any remaining questions. We have about three minutes left and uh, I'll wrap it up in just a minute. But um, any other final comments or questions for our presenters? Um, so anyway, what I was saying was thank you all so much for coming and uh, thank you so much to our presenters, um, both for their work in the book and then their generosity to come in and talk to us about, um, about their ideas and, uh, and their perspectives. I think Jacob and Shana, you may have the next uh, impetus for your next study. <laughs> how, how does all this happen in the COVID world? Um, but I did wanna leave you with our contact information as well as uh, the short link to the, to the author series and our next presentation will take place next Wednesday. If you can see that, I'm trying to get the bar out of the way here. Um, so we have a January pact of really good and ideas and uh, we definitely look forward to seeing you there. One last thing I'll say is that the book as of yesterday is now print on demand. So um, once we get the slide out and the presentation recording out, uh, on that first slide, you'll see the short URL if that's of interest to you. So with that, thanks again to our presenters and to our audience and have a great Thursday.